Thank you. Good afternoon. In true Israeli fashion, I want to start with a direct question. Do you know this guy? Some of you? No one? OK. So for those of you who don't know him, this is Kevin Finster. He is a respected security researcher that found a critical vulnerability in one of DJI's drone system. This vulnerability, according to reports, leaked personal information of their consumers. Now, although Kevin has lots of hair, he wanted to wear the white hat. He wanted to report this vulnerability to DJI under their just launched new bug bounty program. But at the time this program was launched, there was no clear technical or legal scope. So according to reports, Kevin contacted DJI. And in private the communication, according to reports, they indeed authorized that the vulnerability was in scope. Not only that, my friends, they also offered him for that bug the highest reward, $30,000. Not bad, right? For you hunters here, not bad. Well, then the plot thickened. According to reports, DJI also wanted Kevin to sign an agreement that he found was one-sided, that left him legally exposed. When Kevin refused, according to reports, they threatened him with legal action under the notorious Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Well, how does the story end? Kevin ended up walking away from an approved $30,000 bounty. Yes, my friends, a new Tesla. Let's take a moment to appreciate that loss. Well, I'm here to, tech, to talk with you about what we, all of us, can do as a community to make sure this doesn't happen again. My friends, this is your wake up call after lunch. More and more, we hear about legal threats for security researchers, even reporters that are getting fronted for white hat research. This is such a big problem that the, Center for Long, that the Center for Democracy and Technology has asked 50 experts and advocates to express their concern about this issue. And these might be people that you know and appreciate. And today we'll talk about how we can change a small part of that, the bug bounty legal landscape. So I know many of you hunters are here, or maybe there are people that are running a bug bounty program. So raise your hand, please, by show of hands, who here is participating in a bug bounty, involved in a bug bounty, knows about this term, a bug bounty. Many of you, thank you platform people there in the back, thank you so much. How many of you accessed the web page of a bug bounty policy? Nice. Now, please be frank. How many of you read all the different legal terms of all the different bug bounties and the platforms? There is, I see one hand. Okay, not too many of you, right? Well, let me tell you, I read them. And the result is a bit surprising. I accept this, this biggest lie of the information age, and sometimes people don't read the small letters. And not always we have a big screen like this. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell you today why we should all start to pay attention. Now, what we will see is that bug bounties are exploding. They attract hackers that want to follow the rules but the rules won't let them. Therefore, we need to start thinking about changing the rules. Now, since this is a terms of use talk, a little bit of a disclaimer of my own. While I am a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer, and <laughs> I'm not admitted to practice law in the United States, and this is not legal advice. So software is eating the world, and the bug bounty economy is exploding. We have millions of bounties distributed 
to tens of thousands of hackers. Just look at those numbers. We have now a bug bounty for the Pentagon, for food chains, for the US Army, for Starbucks, for financial institutions. We are even giving hackers L reward mileage. Everything to make them a part of a solution. Now, in three and a half decades, bug bounty evolved from this marketing gimmick, report a bug, get a bug, to a Senate bill suggesting to enact bag bounties in the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security, an icon of the establishment. From the GDPR to recent FTC degrees, bag bounties, my friends, are all over the place. Now, this is a wonderful shift in how we view researchers, and I do agree with my sister, Karen, that hackers are an important part of the Internet's immune system. My question is then why here inside our industry we are still attacking friendly hackers instead of helping them to help us. Or in other words, my friend, bug bounties are already popular. It's time we also make them fair. And if we want to make them fair, we need to start thinking about these questions. We have this bug bounty exploding economy, but who dictates the rules of the game. Are bag bounties a true safe harbor as they claim to be? Who safeguards the legal interests of that individual hacker of the crowd, considering this is a very risky legal business? Well, I read a lot of terms, hundreds of legal terms to understand because the, question, the answer to the question starts with the fine print. And what I found was surprising. Platforms and companies sometimes put hackers in legal risk by shifting the risk of liability towards the hacker instead of clearly creating safe harbor and giving authorization. And this is some of the examples that I've seen. While some programs, even the Department of Defense until recently, would commit under contract not to pursue legal action against hackers that stay within scope, Hackers will just leave hackers exposed. Or maybe they will just say, you need to comply with all laws here on Mars, in your jurisdiction, wherever. How many of you have seen that kind of language? Some ends here, right? This is a popular language. And I don't, I'm not saying it's not okay. I'm saying you need to give that authorized access to the hacker to enable him to follow the law. Or in other more severe cases, the company might include a reference in the bug bounty policy to the general end user license agreement. Yes, my friends, that contract that often says, guess what? No hacking, no spoof spoofing, no attempt to gain unauthorized access, no reverse engineering. So this is creating by default liability for the hacker for just doing what we asked him to do. It doesn't make a lot of sense. If you want to reference the EULA, then like PayPal, for example, you can explain that the bug bounty will prevail in case of a conflict. Now, in other cases, why not just say you don't have any permission to test the system? Here is a bounty, but you don't have any permission. Yes, this is still a problem in 2018 in contracts in bug bounties. Other problems might include separating the legal terms from the technical scope. We all know that's a really great strategy to get your hackers to read the legal terms. Or just not having any legal part at all. And you can guess there is one company, very big one, that is doing that, running a very big bug bounty with millions paid with no legal part. Or there might be conflicts between a different set of contracts, the one that the platform uses and the individual program. And except for disclosure, the hacker is expected to resolve those kind of conflicts. Our legal expert, right? OK, so bottom line, after looking at hundreds of terms, while program often and usually focus in great depth into the technical scope, my friends, the legal part the authorization to access the system is either lacking, 
non-existing or ignored. 2018, the bug bounty economy is exploding, but safe harbor is not the standard. It's the exception. And my findings are also supported by these findings by a group of researchers, my future co-authors, by the way, that analyzed 177 policies on HackerOne platform and only found 17 of them have a partial safe harbor, which is a commitment not to pursue legal action. They also found that policies are really complicated. How complicated? It requires college edu education at least to understand them. Their readability score in in uh, type of indexes we use in the academy is 40. Just to compare, a lot of you is around 30. So that's how complicated. And this is paradoxical, why? Because bug bounties are supposed to be legal, right? This is how we compete with the, bug, with the black market. And we also know that hackers care about their legal risk. This is, for example, a research that found that 60%, 6 zero, of the hackers mentioned that threat of legal action is a consideration why not disclose a vulnerability with a vendor. Yet, although, although legal incentives should be important, we still see terms that are in conflict with the mere purpose of security testing. And you're probably asking why, so let me tell you. This is because this is a regime governed by take it or leave it, I accept contracts drafted by platforms and companies. The individual hacker it lacks sometimes the legal knowledge or more importantly, the negotiation power to change this reality. This is why it's up to us, all of us, industry, individual hunters, vendors, platforms, to demand to see a safe harbor in every bag bounty to make that the standard. And how, we, how do we do that? So we need to take a small dive into the legal landscape. So bear with me. It's not new that the law struggles to facilitate white and gray hat hacking. And this is paradoxical because more and more regulators, and just check out the new FTC degree, they recommend companies will enact coordinate vulnerability disclosure programs or bug bounties. But there is a bit of good news. The law enables you, private companies, through contract law, to authorize access to security researchers and thereby basically create a regime where the hacker is not in risk. Yes, only for in-scope testing that you carefully define, but that's possible. And this is something that we control and we can change because this is contracts. So our fourth insight, my friend, that this is a regime controlled not only by vague and overbroad laws like the CFAA, it's also a regime controlled by a lot of contracts that apply to thousands of thousands of hackers that we here inside our industry con control. And our second insight is that in the land of anti-hacking laws, consent and authorization is what matters. So how many of you are familiar, heard of CFA or the DMCA? Many hands in the air, right? Okay. So in a nutshell, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act criminalizes and sometimes creates also civil liability for intentionally accessing a protected computer and obtaining information without authorization or in a manner which exceeds authorization. Notice authorization. The DMCA, an amendment to the copyright law, prevents or convention of technological barriers that effectively control the code as copyright protected work. This includes avoiding or bypassing measures without the consent and authorization of the copyright owner. Notice again, authorization. Now we also have a new, now pending renewal, DMCA good faith security research exemption. But if you take a look at the fine print, you will find that right now, we will see how this will be renewed. That exemption also requires 
that the access, the testing would be in compliance with all laws. Yes, guess what? Including also the CFAA and contract laws and all those EULs that I've just shown you. So in the end, there, are, there is a relationship between them. It boils down to the contractual language of the bag bounty terms. This is why authorization in the bag bounty terms is so important to facilitate security research. We also have this potential agency problem where basically the legal interests of the hackers, the platforms, and the vendors are not aligned. And because this is a take it or leave it regime, the risk is that the legal risk will be shifted towards that individual hacker. So what do we do? How do we change that? First of all, we understand that we have, if we are doing bug bounties, then we want to attract hackers that want to follow the rules. And if the rules won't let them, we need to change them. We need to make sure safe harbor and clear consent matters. And the way we do that is to standardize the language. We create one set of terms across platforms, vendors, and companies. So if you're running a bug bounty, you should have a, legal, a set of legal terms. Not only is it important for the authorization, it's also, it's, it's also important because you need to make sure you do not confuse the hacker. There is no limitation to the testing. Then we should eliminate all paradoxical terms. So again, EULAs are for users because EULAs have anti-hacking, no reverse engineering language. So if you wanna subject the hacker to the EULA, make sure that you have a provision explaining what governs in case there is a conflict, because in most cases, there will be a conflict. The next step is to increase the salience of legal terms. Ladies and gentlemen, and especially hunters, this is the term that you need to know. Salience is a term from consumer law that basically says that when consumer with their feet, when hackers vote with their fingers, and they don't participate in programs with lacking terms, then drafters have an incentive to change the term. Then the market polices the quality of the term. So I have created a slogan, say no to no safe harbor, or a sticker. Hackers, no safe harbor, don't participate. Vendor, no safe harbor, don't launch the program. And platforms, I know these are your clients. But there is no, if there is no safe harbor, tell that client something. Don't launch a program like that on your platform without saying anything. This is how we make the exception of safe harbor the standard. Now more and more companies are including this kind of a commitment that I call a partial safe harbor, which is essentially saying that if the hacker is in scope, if he follows the careful guidelines in terms of disclosure, testing techniques, et cetera, then they will not pursue legal action. But this is a contractual commitment. Clear authorization under the relevant law negates the foundation of the whole legal claim. Therefore, it's more powerful. And here, it's not just me saying that. The Department of Justice, the people entrusted on CFAA enforcement, they understand the risk of bug bounty terms, and they launched a framework. They published it on July, and they suggest that you should have clear authorization for in-scope testing under the CFAA, basically authorizing the access for the hunter. And I worked on that, and in my no legal advice capacity, I added the DMCA, and any applicable anti-hacking laws because there are state anti-hacking laws as well. And if you wanna follow up on this issue, this is my GitHub project that Ed Overflow helped me with because I know little of GitHub. And you can find there basically all the different safe harbor language I suggest in order to create standardization in this field. Now, is that enough? No, because eight months has passed since the, Depart since the Department of Justice released their framework, and since I have started speaking about these issues in DEF CON. Yet, can you guess how many programs until now adopted an explicit safe harbor like DOJ in their non-binding recommend recommendation guidelines suggest? Any guesses from thousands of thousands of programs, or at least two thousands? 
Any guesses, my friends? How many programs comply with the recommendations of DOJ? Two, nice, okay. Now, I know because I track them, I have a Hall of Fame for safe harbors. And in my Hall of Fame, I only have two companies, sorry, three companies and Ed, okay? And Ed is great and I love him. But we need more companies as well. So, how do we change that? How do we create more and more adoption? Standards are the answer. We create standardization of legal language across industries and platforms in light of the Department of Justice framework. Then we have one language, like Creative Commons, like open source. This creates an industry benchmark to what is a good safe harbor. It reduces the informational burden on the hackers because now they know how this kind of language should look like. It also reduces transaction costs because now you have a template to go to your lawyers, to your vendors and suggest. Then we create a reputation system for the quality of bug bounty policies. Now we all know hackers have a reputation system, right? For the best hunters with Signal. What about a reputation system for the companies? We need a system like that. Then we work on third party authorization to include language in the contracts that authorize access and that make sure that the vendor, your third party, is aware that you are operating a bug bounty. This is more complicated, but I'm working with this with the community. After that, we work on education and simplify disclosures because the legal language I've seen is complicated and just a teaser, it includes sometimes binding arbitration. Yes, there is a bug bounty with binding arbitration, for example. So we need to simplify the disclosure we need to educate the crowd, the hackers, about the legal risks involved in bug bounty. And platforms have a responsibility to do that as well. After we simplify disclosure and create more education, platforms need to work on standardization by actively vetting the terms and knowing in each program what is the legal risk the crowd is enduring. That's also part of their responsibility. They could be engaged in safeguarding the interests of the crowd. They can actually take a commitment unto contract law that in-scope testing shouldn't be sued by the vendor. So we have good news and bad news. Bad news, there is a lot to be done, definitely. But good news, this is up to us. This is contracts that we control. We don't need a CFRA reform. We don't even need the DMCA exemption in the Copyright Office. The people in this room, and you know that I'm talking about you, you have the power to change that because you control a lot of contracts. So change could be made right now. We just need to think or maybe start thinking about that individual hunter that wants to follow the rules, but, in, but he is not in a negotiation position. So we need to speak and talk about this important message in his behalf. And I wanna end with some hope. My friends at Dropbox, I hope I can call them friends, they recently launched an amazing, really amazing policy with safe harbors in light of the Department of Justice framework. They even, they are even allowing third parties, so other companies to copy paste their language. And they even have a DMCA safe harbor, a waiver of DMCA claims. Now, while I can't say I had nothing to do with it, and if you're following my legal bug bounty project, you might have seen that on Twitter, but I think it says a lot about what this company does for hunters and how much they care about hunters. That is why in my paper that explores these issues, I gave them a really big shout out. And this is forever will be documented in the paper. And if you're not motivated by now to help me solve this because I'm just one person and I need all of your help, 
Then let me give you just one more story for motivation. Remember Kevin, that guy that reported the vulnerability to DJI? In the day that E tweeted about this mess that got a lot of media buzz, the same day, DJI launched the most comprehensive bug bounty policy legal safe harbor I've seen. Really some pro hunter stuff. Authorization under the CFAA, the DMCA, some really good stuff. This means a lot about what this community has the power to do. I am just one person. I cannot do this alone. And I'm happy to say that more and more platforms and vendors has reached out to create a standard. Think about it for one second. I first spoke about this issue at Sky Talks at DEF CON last year. The first question that I got was, well, have you ever heard about someone that got sued in a bug bounty? Then last year, I told them, well, don't wait for the first story. Don't wait for it because the, you know, it's on the wall. Don't wait for it. Months later, we hear about Kevin. Maybe if this community work together to push the conversation on safe harbors months ago, well, just maybe Kevin could have gotten his Tesla. Thank you very much. You can follow me on Twitter and continue this conversation. You can follow Legal Bug Bounty, which is not legal advice. And I encourage you to take action. Talk, you are, many of you are involved in a bug bounty, will be involved in a bug bounty. Ask your lawyer, what is the risk? Talk to me, talk with your lawyers. Take a look at the Department of Justice guidelines and take action to change this reality. I'm open to your questions. Yes. I, de I definitely know there is a lot of work done on that uh, by NIST, I believe, and others. There is an ISO standard that Katie Missouri's um, uh, basically was um, uh, very involved in creating. Uh, I know that the Europeans are working on that. Uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure is on the rise. I don't think there is a problem there. I think there is a problem with the safe harbor for hackers because I have heard about coordinated vulnerability disclosures gone sideways because they don't have a commitment to the hacker and you are basically reporting, providing evidence and you are just at their mercy. So I think those both, both of these conversations should go together, right? We can't just have, you know, white hat disclosure with no ethical requirements on the company side. That is not fair. More questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is there is there something about um, internal or in-house legal departments that maybe are more in better to have access to kind of how you um, engage with them? Or so I can tell you that the big companies, the bounty craft participants, for those familiar, and the platforms are well aware, um, and they're actively doing stuff to change this. And, and I want to compliment them and, and encourage them and give them the credit for that. It just takes time. I think the problem is ignorance on smaller programs and sometimes ignorance of the lawyers. And I'm very happy to say that now we have a Department of Justice guidelines, basically, for those lawyers to read and understand that this is not just Amit Elazari. This is the crime division of your federal government suggesting there is a problem here and you need the safe harbor or recommending to be exact, to be correct. 
So uh, definitely, and there is a problem where big companies are not taking the leadership in terms of really, you know, showing to this community how this should be done, except Dropbox. Uh, because small companies, they might not be in the business of suing hack white hat hackers. The government might not be in the business of suing white hackers. But smaller companies that are now adopting bug bounties, which are exploding and are not as mature in terms of you know, legal department, they might be doing that. And then we see scenarios like we have seen. Yes? We can take, just by the way, we can take probably one more question and that's it. And if you have any questions afterward, feel free to come to talk to the speaker afterward. Thank you. So that, I, I saw one, yes. Yes, according to reports. Okay, so what can you do in terms of the hunter or in terms of the company? Either, okay, so this is not legal advice, but, and I'm not admitted in the United States, but, um, this is why safe harbor are so important. In that case, according to reports in communications, they in fact authorized that the bounty was in scope, and therefore I think they had a very weak unauthorized CFAA claim because they already basically authorized the access, as to my understanding according to reports. In this, this is why it's important to have a commitment up front because then the company cannot waive that letter and legal threats in negotiations. But, you know, rules goes both ways. And this is why, if this is the rules in terms of disclosure, if this is the rules in terms of rewarding, in terms of security techniques, this is your scope. And if you're out of scope, and there is, long, there is no language, and it's, this is not good faith violation of the scope, and there is no language with respect to good faith violation, then you should know you're exposed as well. So this is why I think clear authorization works well for both sides. And we can keep this conversation going if I haven't answered your questions. Let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you.